Every two minutes, a woman is raped or sexually assaulted in America. Every person in this country has probably been affected by it in some capacity. Hi, I'm Liz Fields, I'm an editor here at Vice News and I'm going to be speaking today about a published piece that um, focuses on America's sexual assault kit backlog. I really look forward to receiving your questions today. Hey Liz, thanks for coming on the show. Uh, we've got a great group of people who want to talk to you and the first one great. is Leora. So let's say hi to Leora. Hi Leora. Hey Liz, how are you? I'm well, how are you? Great, thanks. So, I mean, there's so much um, widespread dismissal of the claims of rape victims because of this larger culture of slut shaming um, that we all exist in. And reading your excellent piece, um, you know, I was reading it through this lens of the culture of slut shaming. And so my question to you is, um, do you see a connection, um, you know, between um, this mindset, um, and we've seen that in your reporting on the part of law enforcement, that they don't need to take these claims seriously? Um, is there a connection between that mindset and the existence of this backlog? That's a great question. And in my mind, I think there is a direct correlation between the backlog of untested rape kits and this uh, tendency to disbelieve or reject survivors' claims of sexual assault. Uh, when I talked to Wendy, who uh, is a survivor in, in the story, she overwhelmingly had positive things to say about the way that the Lake Charles Police Department had handled her case, but she did mention a couple of instances where she had received skepticism and disbelief on her behalf. Um, and one of those instances actually happened right after she had gone undergone this horrendous sort of very invasive um, hours long rape kit exam and the responding officer came up to her and said are you sure this isn't just a rape deal I mean sorry a drug, drug deal gone deal. bad and well so what I mean even if it was and it wasn't there is no way that we can correlate, I mean, a drug deal gone bad with her claims of sexual assault. And one of the other things that I came across in my research, which was very disturbing, was that about 86% of sexual assault claims never make it past the police reporting level. And so uh, that means that those cases never make it to prosecutors and cases are shut and evidence shelved, those rape kits never get tested. So um, that is an inherent problem that needs to be fixed. But at the same time, I don't think we can just uh, put that onto police and law enforcement. It's a systemic thing um, that affects all echelons of society from uh, law enforcement to prosecution to lawmakers and even everyday um, families, uh, colleagues, and everyone else in society that do sort of have a tendency to reject uh, this, the, the stories of survivors. Um, and it's something that we need to address as a society as well. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, uh, I, I agree um, that it goes so much larger and not to isolate law enforcement. I just, I'm pulling out um, uh, an excerpt from your article um, about how investigators said that since she couldn't recall the masked man's face and then one officer suggested she might be able to recognize his penis if she saw it again and that this elicited laughter from others which of course is just such a horrifying um, experience um, that this young woman had to go through to be shamed um, in such um, a horrible manner after she had already been victimized. Um, and, you know, that really just drove home the point that um, so many um, members of law enforcement don't have the training um, to recognize that rape is a, is a crime, like a basic, basic fact. Um, and yet certainly in this case, they really bungled it big time. So, um, and, and I think that you, um, you know, explored that really well. Well, thanks, but you know, I, the disturbing thing is that was a horrific moment, especially as this just happened right after the trauma. And um, you know, as, as you know, uh, memory is not forgiving of trauma. And so a lot of the time 
when survivors can't immediately recall certain events or their stories change when they remember new events. It's often seen by police as uh, a lack of cooperation and uh, that can be changed through police training and when I spoke to Dr. Kimberly Lonsway who uh, works for the End Violence Against Women International, which trains police specifically in how to deal with sexual assault investigations. She revealed to me that uh, police have very little, if at all, training in sexual assault um, investigations, which is something that, you know, is, is shocking because it, so many of these happen every day, you know. Every two minutes, a woman is raped or sexually assaulted in America. And that's a lot of, of like, but, well, not all of them are actually reported. So even if we discount those, and then we get to the point where the women are actually tested in hospital, um, after that, there's a whole bunch of, like, thousands of these kits that just sit on the shelves because ultimately it is up to the police and um, their discretion to push the case forward. Yeah, which actually protects rapists, right? Um, because, you know, A, the rapist is free to go and serially rape others. Um, and then women know about this backlog. They know about the existence of the backlog. And then knowing then that knowledge becomes a deterrent to want to come forward themselves. Um, so it just perpetuates itself. And, and you know, as I say, and as, and as you um, say as well, this is very much connected with this larger cultural problem. Um, if I may, I have another question. Um which is, um, I know you discuss both sides of the issue in the article about whether after a certain, um, you know, lapse of time has occurred, um, whether or not the victim should be given a choice to test the kit after, you know, after finally the backlog is addressed after however many X years. And, you know, you gave right. the case of 20 years, which is, you know, really just unbelievable. Um, but, you know, should that victim be given a choice? You give both both sides. I'm wondering what you think. Well, you know, I it, it is an extremely difficult issue that one that uh, authorities and law enforcement are working through right now. I mean, when Wendy got her test 20 years later, she was not happy to get that. She fell to her knees, was wailing, like, and her colleagues had never seen her before like that, and she was. She told me at that point she was at one of the best places in her life. She was running half marathons, chasing after kids. And um, for other women, I had a survivor tweet at me last night that it was like rubbing salt in the wound. And so for those women, you know, we can't reject the, their, their personal wishes um, to not have their kids tested. But on the other hand, there's the argument that if you do test all kids, that there is a chance that you can get um, serial rapists off the street who often cross state borders and, and everything else. But I think this is one of the very crucial issues that task forces and law enforcement are working towards resolving, and there's still no finite answers to that. Um, I think one of the things that they can do uh, what Houston did was actually send out a PSA announcement to all the women um, out there uh, and said, we're testing all these kids, we're finally clearing our backlog, and you can choose to come forward or not. And that's one way of doing it. But so far, this is a relatively new thing that, you know, that these backlogs are actually starting to get tested and there's still such a long way to go. Um, but these, these issues will keep arising and to keep the discussion going is, is what's important. Thank you so much, Liz. Thank you for exposing this issue. Thank you for coming on and asking some great questions. Yeah, thanks, uh, Vera. So, Liz, we actually got a video message on Skype this morning um, from great. Morgan. I want you to take a listen to that. I'm Morgan and I'm from San Francisco and I would like to ask um, for this on the line is that when it comes to the rape, uh, the rape kit test, is there like a, I guess, waiting list to get it actually tested? 
like you know how there's an organ donor list is the same thing like that and how would a woman get kind of bumped up on this list um, if it exists but uh, you know that's what I'd like to know this week on On The Line so thanks. That's a great question Morgan and in short I would say no there is not a waiting list. Um, the accrual of uh, untested rape kits has been happening over decades and uh, what is happening now is that finally we're, we're starting to get funding to test that backlog but it's also inevitably as I mentioned before up to um, investigators to decide whether these kits will be tested and there, there are a number of reasons why um, they don't think they can uh, sort of push it forward to the prosecutor prosecution level because um, either of uh, a lack of supporting evidence in, in other areas or, or whatnot. So um, unfortunately you can't sort of get pushed to the front of some kind of um, line uh, but as more funding comes through we're hoping that you know more kits will be tested in different cities. Um, so it's just a matter of uh, keeping on getting survivors' stories out there and putting this issue in the spotlight. Great. So, you know, with that, let's say hi to Danny, uh, who's calling us on Skype. Um, here she is. Danny, hi. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed your article, and I could relate to it to some extent. Um, my perpetrator was sentenced to jail for child sexual abuse on, on me that had happened 30 years ago, so it was a case of, of later in life um, prosecution and um, kind of resurrecting the, the, the crime and all that came with it after several decades. Um, and my experience with the police department was astoundingly positive. Uh, same goes for the state's attorney. But one piece that was missing for me, even as a mental health counselor, was that I was not prepared for the emotional fallout associated with addressing uh, these past crimes. I thought I would feel primarily relieved and, and happy to have dealt with it, and instead uh, it sent me into a tailspin. So when we were speaking earlier about you know Wendy, and, and I'm sure this is um, common for a lot of victims, oh my goodness, do I even want this tested, I, I, or if in the case of a rape kit, I'm wondering uh, about the mental health angle, I mean, where it's not a binary, oh, this is too upsetting, so you can't do it. Um, are municipalities who are digging up these old crimes open to exploring the options of counseling and a different level of victim advocacy for people who experienced crimes a long time ago? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And there does need to be a holistic approach to this. And, and one um, angle that law enforcement and authorities have been pursuing is um, this victim-centered approach which means that they're helping like in the in the case of Houston they brought in a special victims advocate to sort of hold their hand as they will through the whole process so they had someone there that they could rely on and to speak with and and seek other counseling services if they needed to because it is so intimidating to go into a police office I mean a police department full of male officers and explain to you exactly what happened to you um, there are also some great programs uh, like the SANE nurses program the sexual assault nurse examiners and they go through the whole process with you as well they need to be definitely more programs but there are some sort of um, assistance like programs being provided at the moment I mean, I, and I want to ask you more on that front, like your experience in um, and how you went through that and, and, and what time this was actually. Yeah, um, I just, I realized, I guess it was two years ago this summer that I had been abused as a child and your article really resonated with me because even though there wasn't a rape kit, I knew the crime had happened, I knew my perpetrator was out there, and it was a question of finding evidence. So in my case, I went to the Montgomery County, Maryland um, Police Department, I had a wonderful detective, I, there was a victim advocate there for me as well, and um, I reported the crime, and I did not have any um, linear memory of it, as you addressed in your article, just um, traumatic memories aren't stored the same way as regular memories. Um, so we did a phone sting, and he confessed. Uh, so that was the equivalent, I was kind of like my rape kit, where we had definitive evidence that um, my perpetrator had indeed committed 
these crimes. And um, I mean, overall, it was a very positive experience, but I think the fact that I present as a very competent, high-functioning adult kind of um, put me in a position where I didn't feel like I needed to avail myself of certain resources and they weren't necessarily presented to me because I came in as a, you know, I think I was 36 when I reported it. I didn't, but I felt like I was eight. So that was the, the issue that I experienced in terms of the delayed uh, reporting and, and quest for justice. Mm -hmm. And that's something I think I tried to address a little bit in the article is that every survivor's experience is so different and so unique. And your mind uh, from when it happened to the point where you might end up prosecuting it will change like and an emotional it's like a roller coaster going up and down mm -hmm. um, and so it's difficult at that time to get the exact kind of help that you always need and and there are other people's assumptions I guess on the way you should behave and the way you should act um, which dictate how people respond to you um, so all I can say is I think the more education, the more voices we are able to get out there on this issue can make people more uh, understand better exactly what survivors are going through. Yeah, I completely agree. I think there's definitely a piece of just awareness. And, and some people just don't understand and they assume it would be all positive or an adult always can access adult skills and coping mechanisms. And you know, in the case of trauma, that's not always true. So I definitely agree that awareness and conversation and dialogue about sexual assault and sexual abuse, even though it's so highly stigmatized, is an important component. Anything else you wanted to ask? No, that's it. So thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. Yeah, Danny, thank you so much. So, uh, Liz, I have uh, another person on Skype. Go figure. Um, this is Wagatway, uh, who I want you to talk to. So, let's say hey. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm well. So, I hear you have questions for me. Yes, I do. Well, first of all, I wanted to thank you for writing this piece. I really... Um, really enjoyed how cognizant you were and like how you were very intentional about expressing how hard it is to go through the you know the the rape kits and trying to you know using the criminal system to try and get justice i think that was really um you know i connected with that really well even though i've never gone through that process um so i Personally, I'm an activist and I do a lot of uh, stuff around representation. So I was really, really interested in hearing about the journey towards like finding the survivors and like how many did you speak to? What made you decide to pick the two that were in the piece? Well, on the record, I spoke to five survivors. Uh, off the record, I spoke to dozens. I would have to say, and this is a, an issue I've been looking, not only for the last few months when I've actually physically been writing it, but uh, for many years because, um, as I might have mentioned before, every two minutes a woman is raped in this country. So uh, there, there's no way, you know, every every person in this country has probably be, been affected by it in some capacity. You know, I have close friends and family who have been sexually abused, uh, producers in this room, people in the city, people in this country, you know, it affects everyone. And so um, I guess choosing the survivor to actually be in the piece um, was a matter of uh, journalistically, it came from a point of view where I wanted to speak with someone who had recently gone through it, who had actually gone through the beginning and right to the end of the court case. And I met Wendy, um, I spoke to her for the first time a couple of days after uh, her uh, attacker had just pled guilty uh, in court. And so that was still a very raw and emotional time for her and getting to know her and um, and being able to speak with her about that, um, she seemed like she was finally ready to open up because for 22 years she was physically not able to say the words, I was raped. And that is something I feel 
like a lot of survivors I've spoken to have, have gone through that very same experience. And, and while what I tried to highlight was that no survivor's experience is universal at all, um, there were a lot of points that she made that um, directly related to um, issues of like police and uh, the prosecution and, and everything else. So she was sort of able to guide the narrative through that. That's great. Um, so related to that as well, I noticed, you know, there's pictures of the survivors and the pieces, and I noticed that they both looked white. I don't know if they are or not, but I was really curious to think about, like, was it hard to find racial diversity amongst the survivors um, that you were speaking to? And do you think it's related to sort of the focus on the piece, just thinking about, like, using the courts to use justice if we're thinking about how you know many people from communities of color don't feel comfortable going to the police or using the courts to find any sort of justice just you know thinking about historically mm -hmm. and even just very recently thinking about that like very tense relationship between um, you know the police and people of color yeah I, I mean that's a great question um, I definitely did not have any trouble finding women of different color who had gone through this experience. Women of every color, creed, race, all around the world have experienced this very same issue. Um, um, as I said before, I think it was more the narrative arc that I chose to um, involve Wendy and Natasha as well. Um, but I mean, on that, I, I would love to hear from you and your experiences because I I think you would know probably better than I uh, about the issues that sort of um, women of different ethnicities kind of face in the legal justice system. So tell me a bit about that. Yeah, I mean, um, I tried very briefly. You know, I was uh, sexually assaulted when I was in college and. I tried to report it to the police at school and they were very resistant. Um, there was luckily one officer there and she was great, but the chief of police really wasn't having it, you know, called me crazy, like befriended my rapist, just these sort of things. And just, you know, as a person who is, who's black in America and just knowing about that relationship between police and like the court systems and knowing that like finding justice just isn't as likely because people might, you know, see me as inherently a, a liar because of whatever sort of stereotypes. Um, I definitely feel like my race definitely um, played a part in like not being able to look to have be able to even think about getting justice through that system because mm -hmm. I know even when I was um, when I reported in college, you know, I got, sort of saw a very similar resistance from the administration as well. Mm -hmm. I think a great starting point is to provide more uh, training for police in, in this matter. And I asked Mary Lenschke, who is uh, the assistant chief in, in Houston, who helped clear the backlog there recently. And I asked her, you know, can you teach compassion to someone, especially a police officer? And, and her reply was, um, you know, some people are obviously better at it than others, but we have to start from a starting point. And yes, people can get better and they can uh, handle situations better. And um, just the more that we can help people uh, overcome their prejudices about, um, I don't know, disbelieving survivors or slut shaming or any of those other um, elements that come into well, that basically hinder the further progress of cases and, and prosecution, um, that that can be a good thing, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, I definitely think that, you know, we even need to start way before people decide to be police officers. If we create a culture where we are, you know, not, where rape myths are not the norm, where we, we know the reality of it, you know, that, you know, people don't lie about this, this is not taken lightly, I think, it'd be easier to have people who are in charge mm -hmm. uh, um, able to be compassionate and understanding. Definitely. Thank you. Do you have any other questions for us? No, that's it. Thank you okay. so much. Thank you. Hey, Liz, uh, you made it to the end of the show. Uh, oh, I did? Yeah. Is that half an hour? That was, uh, yeah, that was about half an hour and 25 minutes. Um, okay. 
why don't you say goodbye to the people at home? Thank you so much for joining us today and I hope to see you next time on the line.